Welcome. Welcome to the 2022 US-China Agriculture Roundtable. Today's program is Think Tank Dialogue. My name is Ming Fan. On behalf of US Heartland China Association, welcome. And today's program will be led by our partner, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. And let me turn this to Director General Wang Lei to lead us through the program today. Director General Wang. <咳>呃尊敬的奎因大使尊敬的各位专家学者大家呃北京是早上啊美国是晚上大家大家好非常高兴能够有机会我们呃在今天这个时候啊呃举行我们中美圆桌农业圆桌会的 and also November, we had two series of agriculture roundtables. And this year, we continue this roundtable series. So I would like to, first of all, thank the US HCA, as well as our CAS team for your hard work in organizing this round table. And today we have the topic of rural prosperity and climate change. I believe this topic is very important for both China and the United States. And just the other day in April the 4th, the United Nations has published a document with 10,000 pages long. And in this document, the, the United Nations mentioned the significance of adaptation and uh, mitigation to climate change. Because for China and the United States, agriculture is very important. And uh, we need to make sure that agriculture is able to contribute to our adaptation to climate change. So rural development and also agriculture development are the main topics for us. And I would like to see we have more and more communication and also exchange of information and ideas on these important topics. I would also like to thank all the distinguished panelists for today's roundtable. And uh, from China side, we have the CAS experts, especially the Rural Development Institute. And also, we also have the United States side. And uh, these experts are, some of them are from RAND, some of them are from uh, Cornell University, and these are very good research institutes in researching into this topic. And now, without further ado, I would like to start the opening ceremony. First of all, I would like to pass the floor to Ambassador Ken Queen. Ambassador Queen has been an old friend and good friend for Cass. So, Ambassador Queen, you have the floor. Oh, so th thank you so much, Dr. Wang Lei, my, my very good friend and my partner and collaborator uh, since we first met in 2017. And I wanna pay special uh, uh, tribute to him for all that he's done to uh, make relations between China and the United States uh, and to promote uh, these kind of intellectual and substantive exchanges. Now, I'm speaking to you from Des Moines, Iowa, and behind me is the Governor Robert D. Ray Pavilion. And it is sort of ground zero in the US-China relationship and certainly the agricultural relationship. Um, this pavilion was designed by a Chinese American architect, fabricated in Beijing, shipped to Iowa and installed by American construction uh, people here. 
And uh, it's named for the governor, Robert D. Ray of Iowa, with whom I traveled to Beijing in October of 1979, when diplomatic relations had just been established, where I had the opportunity to meet and speak with Paramount leader, Deng Xiaoping, and then to travel across uh, your wonderful country to Shanghai and Guangdong. And uh, then it's uh, the pavilion is about 200 meters up the Des Moines River to the first site where Governor Xi Jinping, the governor of Guangdong province and father of President Xi Jinping came in 1980. And I had the great privilege and honor to escort him around Iowa and show him Iowa agriculture and Iowa agribusiness. And 200 meters in the other direction from the pavilion is the World Food Prize Hall of Laureates, where in 2012, Vice President Xi Jinping came and I had the great privilege and honor to welcome him and escort him in the building as he delivered the keynote address at the US China High Level Agricultural Symposium. And it was kind of really one of the true high points in the US China relationship ever since we established diplomatic relations. Five years later, in that same Hall of Laureates, I met Dr. Wang Lei for the first time. Uh, he was here holding an event following President Xi's meeting with President Trump and to build uh, even stronger collaborative working relationships. And as we spoke during that event, I saw and he saw, I think saw in me that we had a lot of similar ideas. And at the end of that event, we signed a memorandum of agreement to cooperate and collaborate. Uh, I later found out that CAVS has about 100,000 faculty, students, and, uh, uh, and staff. And I don't think he knew that the World Food Prize that I led had only 10, but we, we had good ideas and we worked together. And I was very honored to speak at several conferences in China between 2017 and 20. 19 and then continuing uh, virtually in 2020. Now, during that time, unfortunately, our relationship, our bilateral relationship uh, fell from that high level and was at a point where none of us wanted it to be. And I was speaking at the uh, symposium that Dr. Wang Lei had organized on sharing efforts to fight poverty. And I spoke about what I had observed in China from 1979 until 2019, 40 years. And I said, China had really done four R's, was reform, policy reform, rice, research, rice work of Professor Yun Longping, research and roads, and they built roads everywhere. And then I thought, well, no, there's one more R to add to that a fifth R, rural development that was underway and would eventually lead to China basically eliminating uh, poverty, an amazing uh, achievement given that in 1979, probably 70% or more of people in China lived at the poverty level. And so it was at the end of my remarks in 2020 in this virtual, I would say an idea popped in my head, it wasn't in my script, and I said, you know, why don't we, Dr. Wang Lei, why don't we have a collaboration between CAS and a new organization I'm working with now that I'm retired from the World Food Prize, and that would be the Heartland China Association and with Governor Bob Holden and Executive Director Min Fan. And uh, Dr. Wang Lei, uh, found some merit in that. He had uh, his wonderful associate, Ms. Zhang Liwa, connect with uh, Min Fan and began working together. And that produced the 2021 Agricultural Roundtable. And we were able to get politicians from both parties, CEOs of agribusiness companies in America, all to come and participate with similar 
leadership from China. And it was one of the few instances uh, in a year where the political relationship between the two countries was at such a low level, one of the few places where some positive things were happening. And so built upon that, and now are having the 2022 Agricultural Roundtable. And the really good news about this is that it's leading to still another event that we're planning right now, a bigger, more significant event that will happen here in Iowa at that same World Food Prize Hall of Laureates focusing on agriculture. The, Dr. Wang Lei, you mentioned that report about climate change. It uses language I've never heard before, talking about existential threats, the survival of our planet. It's the, the challenges that we have of feeding nine to 10 billion people who will be on our planet in another 20 years is the single greatest challenge in all human history. And it's made even more difficult by climate change and by the threat of pandemic plant and animal diseases. And in all of the discussions I've been in, there are two things that are very clear to me. One is we will not as a species, human beings will not meet that challenge unless our planet remains at peace and unless China and the United States collaborate and work together to uplift Africa, to fight hunger and poverty, to do the research needed to have even more higher yielding crops. So, and to, uh, in rural development, to do those things that are needed to uh, keep the average temperature of earth from rising too high. We have a terrific assembled assemblage of speakers tonight, experts on all of this. If our governments are having trouble collaborating, we have to look to the educational institutions, the private sector to work together. It's shared ideas that lead to great breakthrough achievements. Norman Borlaug working with MS Swaminathan in India they met to have coffee in 1953 that led to Borlaug going to India 10 years later and to India averting famine and to Borlaug getting the Nobel Peace Prize. Yunlong Ping's story is the same. And when Governor Xi Jinping came to Iowa, it was out in a rural area called Amana where he and his delegation learned some things about the American experience that helped them shape Chinese agricultural policy. Ideas are everywhere. I always felt that I learned more about my own country when I was outside it, looking back. And this is the kind of experiences that I hope that we'll have tonight and we'll be building those relationships. Thank you, Dr. Wang Lei, for your wonderful role in making this event happen. Thank you very much, Ambassador Queen, for your fascinating remarks. You have been a very important witness for the development, especially the agricultural development in China and the United States. And also now you are the important figure in terms of World Food Prize, and you're now the advisor for the U.S. Association, Heartland Association. So you have been contributing so much to the agricultural development and the cooperation between our two countries, and we look forward to continuing our work with you in the future. We would like to hold more and more of these round tables and similar events. And now I would like to pass the floor to We're the next speaker. to invite Mr. Wei Ho Kai, Professor and Director General of RDI, Cass, please. Your Excellency Ambassador Queen, experts, representatives, dear friends, good morning and good evening. On behalf of the uh, co-organizer, RDI of CAS, I would like to extend 
my deep appreciation for your participation in the meeting. The U.S.-China Agricultural Roundtable Think Tank Dialogue is co-organized by RDI CAS, as well as uh, BCI CAS, BIC CAS, and also USHCA. It is an academic exchange platform between China and the United States. Last year, we held two dialogue meetings. So this is our third dialogue. This year's theme is rural prosperity and climate change. As we all know, in 2017, the Chinese government introduced the uh, Rural Prosperity Strategy. And in 2018, the Chinese government published the plan for the Rural Prosperity Strategy for 2018 to 2022. So this year, we will complete this plan and program. In 2021, the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress adopted the law of promoting rural prosperity. It can be said that China's rural prosperity has entered a stage of comprehensive development. This is a new stage. That said, we also know, although the US hasn't explicitly implemented a like strategy, U.S. urbanization started early, and its urbanization level is very high. U.S. agricultural employment increment has been low as a percentage of total employment increase in the United States. And U.S. rural residents, including farmers and ranchers, have enjoyed a higher living standard than urban dwellers. But US rural and agricultural development has a lot of experience to be shared with China. Since the introduction of this strategy in 2017, over the past five years, China's rural prosperity strategy witnessed a good start. Related systems, institutions, institutional framework, and a policy system have taken shape. Rural development, rural rejuvenation, and rural governance have all made good progress. From agricultural development from 2018 to 2020, primary industries value added increased by 3.2% annually on average. Last year, the value added of agriculture in China increased by 7.1%, which is a very big figure for agriculture. Last year, we had a great GDP growth rate as well. And in terms of per capita disposable income for rural residents, residents from 2018 to 2021, the figure increased by 6.5% annually on average, 1.9 percentage points higher than their urban peers. Last year, the per capita disposable income of uh, rural residents increased by 9.7%, 2.6 percentage points higher than their urban peers, despite the big income gap between urban and rural residents. The gap has been narrowing steadily year by year, moving in the right direction. In 2020, President Xi Jinping announced to the world that China will strive to achieve carbon peaking before 2030 and carbon neutrality before 2060. Rural prosperity 
includes ecological revitalization, which requires green rural and agricultural development. Therefore, rural prosperity will play a very important role in the carbon goals and the climate actions. So we'd like to fully leverage the role of forest, farmland, and crops, especially their sequestration functionality, and reduce carbon emissions in the related sectors and cut carbon emissions in animal husbandry and farming. And we will also want to improve energy conservation of agricultural machinery and promote green and low carbon development of agricultural retail and wholesale business. All these unimportant areas for carbon emissions reduction and sequestration in rural and agricultural areas, especially since reform and opening up through ecological restoration and forestation. China's forestry coverage increased from 12.7% in the 1970s to 23.04% of the current level. Although this is just a moderate level, this has been growing very fast, almost doubled as compared to the 1970s, making an important contribution to global ecological security and green development. China's rural prosperity strategy will accelerate green development and transition for rural and agricultural development and contribute to China's meeting of the carbon goals. Last but not least, I'd like to wish this think, think Tank Dialogue a complete success. Thank you. Thank you very much, DG Wei. DG Wei is a prestigious expert on rural and agricultural development. He's also a member of the Rural Agricultural Committee of the MPC, which is China's top legislature. Professor Wei has done a lot in terms of policymaking for agricultural and rural development. And RDI of CAS is also China's top think tank for urban and rural and agricultural research. So we want to thank DG Wei and the RDI for their great support for our roundtable think tank dialogue. I hope that through our meeting, we can have for more cooperation on the research of related areas so that we can create more projects for the two countries in these areas while playing a better role in international rural and agricultural development. So much for the opening session. Once again, I'd like to thank our two speakers and our US co-organizer, the USHCA, especially Director Fan Min. Thank you very much. Next, let's proceed to the academic presentations. I will hand over to my colleague, DDG of BIC of CAS, Professor Liao Fan, to chair the session. Thank you. Thank you, DG Wang, Ambassador Queen, distinguished guests. Good morning and good evening. Now let's proceed to the presentations. For this session, we have six speakers. 
that Aaron Fitzgerald, CEO of U.S. Farmers and Ranchers in Action, Li Zhou, Professor and former Director General of RDI CAS, Mr. Ariel Otis Bobby, Associate Professor at Cornell University, Zhang Weijian, Professor of the Institute of Crop Sciences of Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences, Ms. Patricia Stapleton, political scientist at the Rand Corporation. And last but not least, we also have for Professor Pan Jiahua, CAS member, professor, and former director general of Research Institute for Eco Civilization of CAS for comment which will be followed by Q&A and discussion. According to the agenda, each speaker has 15 minutes. To facilitate our discussion and to leave enough time for free discussions, I suggest that you keep to your time. And as moderator, I will give you a signal two minutes before your time is up. So first, I'd like to give the floor to Erin Fitzgerald, CEO of U.S. Farmers and Ranchers in Action. She will be talking about the decade of agriculture. Hello, everyone. I hope oh, just one second. I'll just get my screen here. Perfect. I want to thank everyone for inviting me to be here today on behalf of U.S. Farmers and Ranchers in Action. I'm especially excited to talk about what it means to honor our harvest as we have only 30 harvests. And it's the challenge of a generation and we need leaders in action now for a decade of ag. I believe there are great opportunities for our nations to work together on the food systems of the future. And increasingly we know that the agriculture sector is the most impacted by climate change yet equally the one sector that can enable the transition to a net zero economy. It is the greatest challenge of a generation for both of our nations, and it is my great pleasure to be here today with you. I also have the great pleasure to work with Dr. Ying Wang on my team, who is Chinese and is living in the United States, who is one of the top carbon modelers in our country. And she inspires me every day on the Chinese culture. And I think that that symbolizes who we are in agri culture, agra-culture in the English language. We are a culture of people who can lead collaboration at scale for the world to solve climate change. So in the spring of 2021, there were over 2 billion photos on Instagram from the United States Americans of dinner plates. Now, why do you think that that was? I don't have the number, unfortunately, for TikToks. So you'll have to let me know. But in 2022, 21 and 2022, across all major polls for Americans, Harris, Gallup, in the, in the face of a health crisis, who do you think was the most number one trusted person that Americans were reading about and trusting across all polls? It was our farmers and our grocery store workers. This was actually ahead of hospital and healthcare workers. You see, eating is an agricultural act. And it is when we eat, we see our cultures, our communities, and the very backbone of our economies. And this part of our culture is so ingrained in who we are as Americans, and I would wager your country as well, that when our country is in trouble, we will always historically turn to our dinner plates. And the food and agriculture sector has always stepped up to provide for our nation's dinner tables, our rural economies, and the planet. We did so after the Civil War, after the Dust Bowl, the Great Depression, and after World War II. So it is no surprise to me at all that when the question came to what can we do for our communities and the planet, that Americans and people I would well, all around started looking to their dinner plates for a conversation about the community and the planet. In 2020, that only accelerated. 
And for agriculture in the United States, it is truly absolutely ingrained in everything that we do. It's in our music, it's in our prose and our popular culture and roots. We refer to our nation as the land of milk and honey, a bread basket, amber waves of grain, blessed and bountiful. And as a culture of a people, as Americans, we have a whole holiday dedicated to honoring the harvest, Thanksgiving. And what I have been asking leaders is what does it mean to honor the harvest in the 21st century? There is no doubt that our food makers and our farmers of generations before us have always considered the primary purpose of agriculture is to serve our communities, our nations, and the planet. And we are at a similar precipice when we are looking at our plates, we are asking for solutions. When it comes to climate change, we are asking for who can they turn to? And I am willing to bet that it is we who are in agriculture, that we are a culture of people and the one sector that can be called upon to take action. So we know this, Ambassador Quinn mentioned this, that population times consumption does not equal uh, a sustainable plan. We're borrowing too many resources, finite resources. And then on August 8th, that was the Earth Overshoot Day, right? That was the day we all started borrowing resources from our children and grandchildren. But what does that mean for food and agriculture? That means that in the next 30 years, we're going to have to freeze that carbon footprint, right? Pull carbon out of the atmosphere and reduce black carbon, right? And I have a hard time imagining what the last 10 years even were. It's not the iPhone, right? It, this is the greatest innovation. We're moving faster. I can imagine innovation for healthcare and energy, transportation. But for agriculture, that means that in the next 30 years, we're going to have to produce as much food as we produce in all of mankind up until this point in the last 8,000 years. And that means as well that each growing season, when our farmers right now in spring, even in the Ukraine and everywhere, they have a chance to get it right. They're going to have to innovate in the face of Mother Nature. They're going to have to weather the, and the odds despite everything stacked against them. And make no mistake about it, these next 30 harvests, harvests are really 30 chances. It is a chance to get it right, despite all the odds. And this is no longer business as usual. Eight out of the last 10 harvest seasons in the United States were faced with extreme and episodic events. Where Ambassador Quinn is faced with in 2020, while we were battling a health crisis, we also witnessed a phenomenon called a derecho an inland hurricane wiping out between eight and 10% of the American corn crop. We're seeing drought, we're seeing fires, on top of already a very complex economic business model that is putting stress on our farmers. And our land is precious. We can't grow more food, we're gonna have to innovate our way. And we're seeing all around the world increasing stress on our farmlands. In the United States, we're losing 83 acres of farmland an hour. Those are our flyways, those are our green zones, those are our possibilities of sequestering carbon. And then I think about the actual business of innovation. We all watch cooking channels, right? There's no one chef who makes a spaghetti the same way. It is very, very complicated. Every one of those kitchens are unique. And the same for our farmers. I, every farm is hyper-specific, interdependent to the exact acreage of which they're farming. And they innovate in those recipes with mother nature. It's a biological phenomena to innovate on these farms. There are over 20,000 different soil types. In the United States alone, we have 26 different growing zones on the back of seed packets that tells you what you can plant, when you can plant it, and how to plant it. And guess what? Those zones are changing too. We have over 21 different hydrologic zones 
2,000 watersheds or a zip code or an address for water. And we have to create that recipe on our farms while it's also changing. It's a very complex business model to innovate in. But I get super excited when I start thinking and looking at modelers of climate change, like, well, what is working? What can we do to go solve this? And maybe we just have to look at what's under our feet and go back to the basics of biology. Yes, there are emissions. They go up in the air. That's the black carbon. There's black carbon and gray carbon, but the green carbon, the carbon that can cycle from the sun can sequester carbon. And our soils are already sequestering a hundred times more carbon than is currently emitted in the air. And if we continue to improve and we use the power of photosynthesis and carbon storage. Yes, I will say this again, brown things and green things are the cool things. In fact, they are the only living machines that can suck and eat carbon for lunch every day. And it's these fundamental principles that we need to be able to put to work. Our farmers have been doing this. They're innovating on new forms of technology and figuring out the power of the potential of their soils. We've reduced our carbon footprint. We're at 9.9% .9 to the total US emissions. And we're on a pathway to have that carbon footprint. But what gets me super excited is that with innovation and technology, we could reduce our carbon footprint by minus 4%, or that would be reducing your footprint and finally having a handprint. Or another way to think about it is ushering in the transition to a net zero economy. But it is not enough to have big carbon goals. We see people do that all the time. You have to take a bet on people. And that's where agriculture comes in. You have to have people who care about this topic, who actually live and are the eco workforce, boots on the ground. And when I think about food and agriculture as a eco workforce to committed to go solve climate change, I take, I'm gonna take a bet on 15% of the American workforce who could, if mobilized, could be that transition to the net zero economy. There are 2 million farmers in the United States um, who walk these lands, 40% of our land. So when I think about land, air, and water, this is where 90% of all of our rain and snow falls on these lands, 70% of all of our water is managed in their stewardship, and one-fifth of our carbon could be reduced. It is these people on these lands that we have to help to go innovate, and get the best business models in the next 30 harvests. And make no mistake about it, as Ambassador Quinn said, this is the challenge of a generation. It is gonna take fundamental leadership in action, unprecedented, contagious collaboration. It is not unlike going to the moon for the first time or traversing the ocean. It's going to take clarion level of leadership to get this right and weather that storm. That is why we believe that a decade of action as the United Nations is calling for requires an unprecedented action of a decade of ag. And that working from the ground up, from the solutions up, from the farmers and the innovators and the scientists, we can help work on that transition to a net zero economy. We already have been, we've been working in 2020, we launched the goal and the vision. We have over 150 CEOs who have currently stepped up, not having all the answers, of course, but saying that we are gonna lean in and work with farmers and food sector as a sector and lead on these issues. I'll leave you the vision to read. And of course, it's not enough to have a big, bold vision for 2030. We are going to have to build the business models of the future. We have three action tracks to get there. One is to unleash the power of data and rapidly get 
knowledge into the hands of our farmers so they can adapt to climate change. The second is transformative investment for climate smart agriculture. We want to be the number one place where environmental social governance fund to invest in our soils as an asset class for the future. And I will say this, the power of our farmers through every acre and their commitment, it is possible. I am know that the shared innovation of every farmer, every acre around the world has the same ambitions, the same commitments, and it is up to all of us to figure out how to steward that future. I hope that we will have a great conversation today about what we can do to honor our harvest and plan as unbelievable leaders in action for the decade of agriculture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Fitzgerald. And uh, thank you very much. You have saved us uh, one minute and a half. And, uh, you know, in China, we have this old saying that food is the prime want of people. So I do believe that your topic today has a great relationship with this Chinese saying, food is the prime want of people. Agriculture is very important. And you may know that for the past 19 years, consecutive years, the number one central document in the China is always about agriculture. That shows how the Chinese government prioritizes agriculture and rural development issues. And I believe we are going to have a lot of interest, common interest in a future discussion. And now I would like to give the floor to Professor Li Zhou, Professor and the former Director General RDS Pass and he's going to talk about the role of carbon sequestration in China's ecosystem governance. Thank you very much, moderator. Today, I'm going to talk about the effect of ecosystem restoration on carbon storage in China. And uh, currently, adaptation and mitigation to climate change is a very important topic for all of us. And uh, clearly, China prioritizes this issue because you know that in China, we have a very important national strategy, which is the dual carbon, which is a carbon peak by 2030 and carbon neutrality by carbon by 2060. And now I'm going to talk about this from the perspective of the eco system. And uh, we need to think about the polluting carbon versus natural carbon. And uh, this is the first topic. Next slide, please. So we need to control the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. To do so, we have to control the use of fossil fuels and increase the use of wind power, solar power, which will not increase the carbon concentration in the atmosphere. So we need to control the use of carbon-based energy rather than the use of all kinds of energy. Next slide, please. Right. So we need to look at the long-term scale and the short-term 
scale on a long-term scale, the use of carbon will only have a limited impact on ecology, especially in developed countries. But on a short-term scale, such as the 21st century, biological carbon storage plays a significant role in developing countries where the problem of ecosystem degradation still exists. This explains why China includes it as one of the key measures for achieving the country's carbon peaking and carbon neutrality goals. Carbon emissions since the uh, Industrial Revolution in the 1750, global carbon dioxide emissions have grown a lot. According to the estimate of Cicero in Norway, from 1850 to 2017, human fossil energy consumption emitted 2.1 trillion tons of carbon dioxide, most of which were generated in the 120 years since the 20th century. According to a collaborative study by researchers from Israel and the United States, since the first agricultural Revolution, the total global biomass has decreased from 2 trillion tons to about 1.1 trillion tons, and the existing biomass around the globe is equivalent to 550 billion tons of carbon. Based on this fact, the estimation is that the total global biomass carbon storage has been down by 500 billion tons. From this, we can tell that carbon-based Energy has increased by more than 2 trillion tons, and biomass carbon storage has decreased by 500 billion tons. Even if we can restore the level to the level before the first agricultural revolution, we cannot resolve the 2 trillion tons of carbon dioxide emissions already in the atmosphere. And ecological control is not only one perspective. We are also restructuring our energy mix. From this exhibit, we can see China's clean energy has been growing very fast. In 2021, it reached 25.5%, according to our program, by 2050, it will reach around 80%. So this is the thrust, thrust of our policy measure. From this figure, we can see that carbon-based energy such as coal power generation is dropping sharply and clean energy keeps rising. So this is further interpretation of our program. Next slide, please. From this case study of Qinghai province, we can see that clean energy already plays a dominant role in meeting power demand in Qinghai province. We also look at um, specifically at the uh, PV power, solar thermal power, wind power, hydropower. Clean energy now accounts for 89% of total power generation in that province. Next slide, please. From this, we can see the correlation and synergy between clean energy and climate actions. In Qinghai on a degraded grassland, we installed PV power generation facilities. Water used to clean the solar panels penetrated the ground and improved the growing conditions of the pasture. And it can also effectively prevent fire risks after the grass dies. 
In this way, we can effectively combine animal husbandry and power generation, and farmers can reap the dividends from power generation while increasing their earnings from animal husbandry. This is an excellent case where our ancient animal husbandry can have synergy with clean energy sector. Next slide, please. The overgrazing and deforestation have also impacted carbon cycle. So we need to improve the carbon storage capacity by restoring degraded ecosystems. In February 2019, NASA satellite data showed that the total global carbon storage in vegetation had increased by about 4 billion tons since 2003. China and India are the main forces in vegetation construction. The two countries account for 9% of the world's land area and contribute as much as one third of global vegetation, of which China contributes at least 25% or 1 billion tons. Next slide, please. This exhibit shows China's six major forestry projects and their carbon sequestration capabilities. From this table, we can see our total carbon storage has reached 175 million tons, which is a significant improvement. So restoring degraded ecosystems can have a big contribution to carbon storage. In 2005, our forestry carbon storage was 7.4 billion tons, according to the average annual increase of 2.3% in forest stock in the sixth to the ninth forest inventory periods. The nationwide carbon storage by forest vegetation in 2020 should be 9.62 billion tons higher than the planned amount of 9.5 billion tons. Which shows we had over-delivered on our target. In 2020, China proposed at the Climate Ambition Summit that by 2030, its nationwide forest stock will increase by 6 billion cubic meters compared with the 2005. And if the nationwide forest stock can increase at this rate, the nationwide carbon storage by forest vegetation will increase by 6 billion tons by 2050. And also, China has a grassland area of about 400 million hectares with a total carbon storage of 28.95 billion tons. Due to factors such as overgrazing and other inappropriate ways of utilization and climate change, 90% of natural grasslands have degraded to varying degrees, of which more than 60% are moderately or severely degraded. Research shows that for degraded typical grassland and an alpine meadow, the average recoverable carbon storage potential is 31.58 tons and 34.26 tons per hectare, respectively. Carbon storage will increase by 4.5 billion tons if these degraded grasslands are restored in 40 years. Next slide, please. Our wetland area is 35.8 million hectares with carbon storage up to 7.25 billion tons.
Among them, organic carbon storage by soil is 5.04 billion to 6.19 billion tons. It is totally possible to increase carbon storage by wetlands by more than 20 percent or 1.5 billion tons if the natural wetlands are protected and restored in 40 years. And main measures of emission reduction in agriculture include promoting the return of straw and livestock manure to the fields, reducing the use of chemical fertilizer, pesticide, and film on the premise of guaranteed food security, expanding job opportunities and ways of earning money in urban and rural areas in non-agricultural sectors, reducing farmers' economic dependence on improving the value added of agricultural products and lowering energy consumption in the processing of agricultural products. If used together, these measures could reduce carbon emissions by around 2 billion tons 40 years later. Put together, the carbon storage can reach 14.1 billion tons. So it is quite reasonable that China's top leadership made large scale land greening actions and higher ecosystem capacity as carbon sinks, one of the key tasks for achieving carbon peak and carbon neutrality. And to correct our problems in ecological treatment. In 2004, we promulgated the regulations on shrub forest land specially specified by the state, which requires that shrub forest land specifically specified by the state shall be included in the scope of forest coverage calculation so that arid regions can grow more shrubs and grasslands. And the Ministry of Water Resources also proposed that greening efforts shall be based on water conditions. So areas with the precipitation between 200 and 400 millimeters shall be planted with shrubs and grasses, and areas with less than 200 millimeters in perspiration should primarily adopt natural restoration. So much for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Li Zhou. With detailed figures and rigorous logic, he shared with us the role of carbon sequestration in China's ecosystem governance so that we can meet the carbon goals by 2030 and 2060. As I understand, we have to reduce emissions and increase sequestration and work together to achieve the ambitious goals. Thank you very much, Professor Li, for your very detailed and profound presentation. Our next speaker is Associate Professor Ariel Ortiz Bobi at Cornell University. The title of his presentation is Climate Change and Agricultural Productivity. Welcome. Thank you um, uh, for having me. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Thanks so much for the, for the invitation. Excited to, um, to be here. Um, and, and what I'm going to do today uh, is that I'll, I'll be talking about the impact of climate change. So human, uh, so anthropogenic climate change on agricultural productivity, right? So not on the, I'm going to talk about mitigation, but more on the impacts um, side of this. Okay, so, but I'll start first, with, instead of talking just about the US or China, I'll try to take a step back and think more globally, right, so that we're not operating uh, completely in isolation, and it's important to see what's happening in the rest of the world um, to, to, to regain uh, a better sense of uh, the moment that we're in. So to give you some context, I think it's important when we think, talk about the challenge that climate change uh, poses, to think how to read it, to portray how, how far we've come. Um, earlier, we, you know, this was already mentioned. So thinking about population trends since the 1960s, population has more than doubled. This is global population. So that's what you see um, in, the black, um, in the black line. 
Um, and while population has more than doubled, when you aggregate all the agricultural production in the world, so, so this includes crops, tree fruits, field crops, livestock, everything there, you actually see that the total output from farms across the world has more than tripled, right? So we're producing more agricultural output per capita in the world, which is a great thing, right? When we look on the input side, the things that farmers are putting into the production, so labor, capital, land, chemicals, you know, fertilizer and, and things like that, we see that that, aggre that aggregate input has also risen, has also gone up, but at a slower pace than output. So what that means is that we're actually, glo globally, agriculture has become over time more productive, right? So if we're producing more output per unit of input, it means that we're just making more out of what we're putting in and agriculture is more productive. This is a global uh, picture and you can see that productivity, economists call this total factor productivity, but I'll just call it productivity. It's rising and it's sort of accelerating. And this is great news when you think about the future of agriculture, because we would like agriculture to grow through more productivity not necessarily through more inputs, because more inputs might mean more fertilizer, which has issues with water quality and pollution in certain parts of the world, or more land. So, and there's issues with pro uh, protecting biodiversity um, as well. So the way of the future might be, if you wanna grow agriculture in a more sustainable way, is to think about making more with what the inputs that we're putting in. So, uh, Zooming in, that picture that looks very encouraging is more heterogeneous. When we start looking at different countries and how productivity is rising, you see the dashed line in the middle is the global productivity growth. And this is data from the US government, from the Department of Agriculture. You see that some countries are actually stagnating or growing much more slowly, right? And you have some countries that are actually growing much faster. And you see here countries like China, for instance, but also the US and parts of Western Europe are still growing in terms of the productivity uh, in the agricultural sector over time, right? So it's a heterogeneous world. If we look at a, a map, a more detailed map of where productivity is rising in the agricultural sector over that period, 70, uh, 71 to 2014, you see that it's very heterogeneous. You know, you see China, you know, Brazil growing relatively fast. Uh, the U.S. also is growing at a very uh, steady uh, uh, rate, same for the Western Europe. But you see many countries in sub-Saharan Africa, many places that you're seeing here in yellow, uh, they are growing much more slowly. And these are parts of the world that might be, uh, as we're going to see in a second, might be suffering from some of the major um, um, impacts of climate change already. Okay, But this is kind of the picture of how we're growing. Overall, we're progressing, but a very different rate across the world, right? Um, and uh, so that's an important thing to keep in mind. Now, going back to this picture, you know, we all wonder what's going to happen. So these projections of population are from the United Nations. And the question is, what's going to happen to these other lines in this graph? How are we going to grow, keep growing our cultural production at a global scale? Is a lot of that output growth going to come from more inputs? Uh, are we going to deforest and, and grow where areas where we didn't have um, um, agriculture before? Or are we going to produce more in the areas that are already producing, that are already in, under agricultural production? So that's a challenge or a choice that a society we, uh, as humans, uh, face. And the elephant in the room, right, is climate change, right? There's a lot of discussion about this, about the future all these different emission scenarios and what could be our climate system in the decades to come. And although a lot of the attention has to be focusing on that future and rightfully so, these are massive changes to our climate system. I want to bring your attention to this area that I just highlighted here in this rectangle, which is what has already passed, what is in our rear view mirror, things that has already happened and what I want you to realize is that is not a flat line. That line is already increasing, meaning that our climate has already changed, okay? We are already in a warmer world. We're in a world that is about one degree Celsius warmer globally 
than it was uh, 150 years ago. Okay, so if agriculture uh, depends on the climate system uh, and the climate has already changed, the question is, well, how has climate already climate change already affected global agriculture? So that's really one of the studies that I recently conducted um, that ended up also one of the studies cited in the in the IPCC report uh, in the um, working group two um, is exactly this question. How much has anthropogenic climate change already affected agricultural productivity at a global scale? So that's exactly the question that we try to answer um, in, in, in this article that was published uh, earlier in Nature Climate Change. And the inspiration for this uh, study came from this figure. And this is a figure uh, from, um, I think this is um, uh, data from the previous IPCC report, the AR5. And the, the, the interesting thing about this is that it, this is output from climate models, from a range of climate models. And what climate modelers can do is that they can simulate the climate system with the influence of humans and without the influence of humans. So when you try to simulate how the Earth uh, atmosphere would evolve when you have CO2 emissions and greenhouse gas emissions in the system, what you get is this blue band, right? This is the average across all these different climate models, right? And you see this, that's called the historical experiment. It's like an experiment that uh, different climate groups are uh, modeling. And what you see is that the observed data, so the, what we actually are measuring, the temperature in the world is the black line. And the black line, solid line that you see, falls well within that um, historical uh, uh, data experiment that you see there. As I said, one interesting thing that you can do is remove, remove human influence from the climate system. And that's exactly what you get in the green band there. That's the historical natural. So it's a, they recreate the historical forces without humans. And you get a more stable climate system uh, then you can see if you go back before 1960s, it would have been indistinguishable. So we didn't have enough of a footprint in the climate system for that to show up. But after the 60s, you see that there starts to be a divergence where we're in a warmer world that we can attribute to human forces. And this is not a surprise. This is basically uh, the basis of a lot of what the um, IPCC uh, is doing. So this was an inspiration for the study. And what we wanted to know is how would the global agricultural system do in a world with anthropogenic climate change and in a world without anthropogenic climate change? And can we compare the growth of productivity in those two worlds, right? So I'll spare you the details about our modeling techniques. I'm happy to talk about that uh, as an academic. I love talking about this stuff, but I'll spare you some of the details. Um, and I'll uh, just say one word about how we capture the whole agricultural uh, system of a country in one single variable. And we use this measure of total factor productivity that I measured, uh, that I mentioned before. And you think you can think about this metric TFP um, as a generalized yield, right? So instead of thinking of say bushels per acre, right? So bushels is a unit of output, right? For say corn uh, per acre is a unit of land that's a partial measure of productivity because you're only looking at one output and one input. Think about TFP as a general version of that for all the outputs and all the inputs. So it's the ratio of all the outputs over all the inputs, right? And you can see here the data, this is again data from uh, um, the USDA, the Department of Agriculture um, here in the US, um, is that in the US context, um, you see that the, the inputs, aggregate input has remained fairly stable over time. So the composition has changed, but in aggregate, it has remained stable, whereas output has gone up over time. So all of that growth in output is driven by productivity. But one of the interesting things about this data is that wet farmers don't pay for weather. <laughs> they don't pay, uh, so that's not measured in the inputs. So you see things like these, these drops here, you see here, in 1983, 1988, 2012, 
Uh, so these are well-known droughts uh, in the U.S. where output uh, dropped uh, because weather conditions were um, not favorable. So we use in that variation to capture how weather affects agriculture at an aggregate scale um, using that, uh, that feature of the data. Okay, so that's what we exploit. So thinking about the results, this is really what we get, okay? What we find is that compared to a world without anthropogenic climate change, because of anthropogenic climate change, we find that globally, productivity growth has been lower, okay? It's as if you have a headwind, okay? Your agricultural productivity is rising. I showed you that before, but it's rising at a lower rate because of anthropogenic climate change. We don't see it on a daily basis because we don't see the parallel world without anthropogenic climate change. So here we have to, we recreated that parallel world and in that world, productivity would have been higher, right? How higher? Well, if I take this percentage term, so here I said it's 20% lower, um, what that means in levels, uh, and this is what I'm showing you here, is that the level of productivity globally that we reach in 2020, would have been reached in 2013 in this parallel world. So that means that anthropogenic climate change has wiped out, has eliminated seven years, right? Seven years of productivity growth over the past 60 years. So that's a substantial change. Productivity keeps rising, it's just rising more slowly. That's what we find in the study, and I can go about um, talking more about this. So the impacts, uh, and then looking at my time that I don't have much time, so uh, the impacts are not that clear. This is a global estimate that I just showed. When we zoom in at different parts of the world, results are less precise. There's more uncertainty as we zoom in. Um, the results are look more severe in warmer parts of the world more tenuous in uh, more uh, cooler parts of the world, but they, the results are very uncertain. You look at places like um, Europe, North America, uh, the, the confidence bands are very wide. So there's a need for more detailed studies on specific countries, you know, like China and the US. I'm actually working with a grad student of mine who's Chinese, uh, by the way, Zhiyun Li, and we're tr working on trying to captured the historical impact of anthropogenic climate change on U.S. agriculture, right, to try to quantify that. And so now thinking about U.S. agriculture, um, one thing that we found in previous research, so this is a different article, is that although agricultural productivity is rising, one thing that we found is that it's growing increasingly sensitive to extreme weather. So when uh, there's a very hot a year, productivity tends to drop more than it used to back before the 1980s. And we go into uh, the reasons of what that might be, but it might be, we find that that might be related to technological changes, changes in the technology. They are not necessarily making agriculture more resilient, okay? Um, we don't say that whether that's a good idea or not. We're just saying, we're trying to document why U.S. agriculture is becoming more sensitive uh, to these extremes, okay? So, um, so that's a study. So going forward, and I'll try to wrap up as quick, uh, quick. I think moving forward, I think, I think it's important to realize that future productivity depends in large part on the investments in research and development of today. Here I'm showing uh, data uh, on Chinese and US TFP. The first panel is public and private agricultural R&D spending. And you see that uh, there's a rise in that, especially in China, there's an acceleration in R&D spending. And that's both in the private sector that you see here, but also in the public sector. But we shouldn't just uh, be happy just by looking at these trends. We also have to think about the intensity of that research and development investment effort. And look at it, one way to look at that is as a share of agricultural GDP, which is exactly what you see here. Uh, in the middle panel, right? Um, when you look at the intensity, you see that the US, for instance, has been investing more as a share of its agricultural economy in R&D, but that is sort of slowing down, okay? Whereas in China, although it's slower, it's actually trending up. So investing relatively more R&D uh, as a share of the economy. So I think these are very critical things to think, to, to keep in mind 
when we're thinking about the next few decades, given all the lags that we have in terms of the returns of this R&D into higher productivity, when we have a, uh, we're facing an increasingly uh, uh, sort of increasing headwind from uh, climate change in uh, global agriculture. So that's what I have for today. Uh, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Professor, for your very interesting presentation. Although I'm not an expert, I have listened very attentively. I noted that you have mentioned a very interesting method to make a distinguish bet distinction between anthropogenic and climate-induced on impact on agriculture. And you also said that without climate factor, agricultural productivity will reach the uh, level seven years ahead of on time. Uh, you've also mentioned lots of uh, areas for research to make the uh, distinction even clearer. I look forward to more papers and research findings in your area. Thank you again. Our next speaker is Professor Zhang Weizian of the Institute of Crop Sciences of the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences. He will be speaking on climate smart crop production in China. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So let me uh, discuss climate smart crop production in China. There are three parts to my presentation. First, I will review the challenges and coping strategy of crop production in China. As we all know, the biggest challenge facing crop production is temperature increase induced by climate change, because this is a key factor for crop development. Temperature increase and regional and seasonal differences in temperature increase all constitute a grave challenge for crop production. Aside from temperature, precipitation is also a key factor. In the past decades, global water distribution and precipitation intensity and frequency have all changed. And this has also led to extreme and adverse weather for crop production with increased intensity. But according to the current estimate, we cannot overcome the trend of temperature increase of at least 1.5 degrees Celsius. This has something to do with the greenhouse gas emissions generated by human activities, including CO2, N2O, etc. Apart from climate change, we also face the challenges of population increase and rising consumption accordingly. Like I said earlier, the main driving factor is carbon increase induced by human activities. In terms of CO2 or methane, and nitrous oxide, the concentration of all three has been increasing. Can agricultural production contribute to the carbon goals while ensuring food security? This is a new question. Aside from these factors, we often come across with emergencies such as conflict and war and pandemic. All these represent 
emergency challenges and threats to crop production. So from these, we can see that our crop production faces myriads of challenges. Climate change and its impact might be reflected in the challenges facing crop production increase. To achieve multiple goals in this area, we need a new agricultural and crop production model. In 2010, FL proposed climate smart agriculture. There are three key points, increasing food productivity and farmers income sustainability, rebuilding climate resilience and adaptability, climate resilient agro ecosystem, reducing carbon emission and promoting carbon sequestration as much as possible. So for crop production, next slide, please. Climate smart crop production is based on climate smart agriculture. It covers three major technological systems, carbon sequestration, emissions reduction, and climate change adaptation, and also technology for increasing production efficiency and the farmer's income, which form the whole system for climate smart crop production system. Faced with these challenges and threats, what is the interlinkage between climate change and crop production? Let's take a closer look. First, the warming impacts on crop growth duration, but with changes in precipitation in terms of intensity and frequency, the growth duration will be affected. So for different regions, the impact varies. And as for crop yield, lots of researchers believe that crop production is adversely impacted, but with rising temperature and climate change, it has a very distinctive geographical impact with different impact on different crops. Take Northeast China, almost all crops grow in the region. And there is winter wheat and also rice, but rice production is very complicated in China, found in different areas with mixed impacts from climate change. There is yield on reduction in other regions, but in Northeast China, the yield will increase. So there are both pros and cons from climate change. Apart from on the growing duration and crop yield, the climate change will also have an impact on planting layout. Take winter wheat with rising temperature. Winter wheat can be planted in farther north areas. This will also affect our crop production. Apart from the impact on crop production per se, there are also other impacts. Climate change will also affect greenhouse gas emissions. For example, with the temperature increases, methane emissions will increase from rice fields. With increasing CO2 concentration, methane emission will also increase according to some researchers, but according to our monitoring, with the rising CO2 concentration, the increase in methane emission has a lot to do with the uh, technologies used in cultivation. And there is another important aspect. The agro ecosystem is a very sophisticated living system. If extreme weather impacts the uh, agro ecosystem, the adaptability and resist resilience of the system will be affected. 
What about the contribution of this uh, agri-food system to HGHG emissions? Lots of the researchers have proved that land-related crop and food production accounts for 30% of anthropogenic emissions. With increasing agricultural productivity, agricultural contribution is likely to rise further. And among the agricultural subsectors, farming related carbon emissions also account for a third of agricultural total emissions. And the three key gases are CO2, methane, and N2O. N2O mainly comes from the consumption of fuels in agricultural production. So that is mainly direct emissions. In terms of crop production, the main emissions are methane and N2O. Methane about 40% to 50%, and O2 about 80%. And in different crop productions, globally speaking, rice production accounts for about 50% of the emissions in China. Rice field accounts for 60% of China's total production. So rice paddies are a key target for emissions reduction. Crop production actually can also serve as carbon sequestration system. Through photosynthesis, carbon can be solidified into organic substances, and part of them will return to field through the return of straw to field. In this way, the carbon can be sequestrated. And biomass of straw depends on where they end. If the straws are burned, then the carbon cannot be solidified. If the straws can be used into an integrated way and be transformed into biofuels, then the carbon can be solidified. So crop production has great potential for carbon storage and sequestration. With the uh, advances in agricultural technology, the contribution to greenhouse gas emissions reduction can be very significant. Technological effects on yield increase and GH reduction can be very significant. In the past decades, the yield has increased significantly in China, and effects of cultivar improvement on GHG reduction are also great. And all are pointing to lower GHG emissions. We have looked at the new cultivars of wheat and found that for most of the high yield crops, the N2O emissions tend to be lower. And so is the case with methane. Apart from cultivar improvement, the yield potentials are huge. We look at the four major crops in China. The blue line indicates the average level, and the red line indicates the uh, on the records of the yield, there is a huge gap. If we can narrow the gap, we will be able to have uh, more space and land to deal with the climate change. And we can place more land under the reclamation program. And our field lands can produce less greenhouse gas emissions. And also land improvement, carbon sequestration, Carbon sequestration for some time has a strong correlation with the crop yield and resilience. But when the organic carbon reaches a certain level, the sequestration or crop yield will stabilize at a certain level. So within a certain range, there is a strong correlation and a great synergy between carbon sequestration and crop yield. Through our defensive forestry and a forestry system, we can boost 
farmland carbon sequestration. This can improve their adaptability and resilience to climate change. And this is also a reinforcing effort for carbon sequestration and crop yield improvement. And also, we need to use some technological innovation to increase the efficiency and also reduce GHG emissions. And now I would like to move on to China's practice to deal with climate change. Actually, the climate change impact is greater in China compared with the world average. And also it's the same with the extreme weather events in China. We have suffered from many extreme weather events in the past few years. And uh, we also have produced more rain or more food. How have we done this? First of all, we have strengthened the climate resilient farming system, such as the early warning system. And also we have been embarking on the active adaptation to climate change. We want to increase the unit yield of major crops in China. And also in terms of the agricultural input, in terms of chemicals, ever since 2012, we have substantially reduced the chemical input. And according to the IPCC factor, each and every year, we have reduced more than 600 tons of equivalent chemicals input. Also, we have the conservative farming system for soil carbon sequestration. And because of these protective farming system, we can reduce the GHG emission. And also we have improved the variety of rice in China so that the main thing emission from the farming of rice has been reduced. And the innovative farming practice in terms of rice is also a very important milestone for China. In the future, I believe we're going to have more and more challenges. Food security is a top priority for China. By the year 2050, we need to make sure that our grain production is equivalent to a middle or medium developed country level. And uh, we also need to embark on the green development or low carbon development. We need to reduce the agricultural emission of GHG. And China has prioritized this, releasing a series of actions. According to China's strategy, I believe agriculture is a very important sector for China to achieve the dual carbon strategy, which is carbon peak and carbon neutrality by 2030 and 2060 respectively. And we need to reduce the emission of methane. And we also need to develop biogas in this way, we can efficiently utilize the limited resources that we have currently. And historically, we had the path of high input and high output, but in the future, we want to have low input and high output. And now a lot of people are talking about climate smart agriculture or climate resilient agriculture. We also want to develop this kind of system for China's agriculture sector. I want to thank the 
Mara, Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. We also want to thank the World Bank and also the Global Environment Facility as well as FAO because joining hands with all these institutions, we have released a series of actions to reduce agricultural carbon emission. And I have listed some of the important documents or the projects that China has with all these above mentioned institutions. We want to have more innovative ways to transform China's agricultural sector. And I am believe that the agricultural decade from 2020 to 2030 will be more promising. Thank you very much, Professor Zhang Weijian. And uh, actually, uh, you have given us a series of important topics. And you have mentioned China's practice, especially how China wants to embark on a path of climate resilient agriculture or climate smart agriculture. China has accumulated much experience in uh, past decades. And I have also noticed that Professor Bobby is an editor in chief for a very important US agricultural magazine. So I believe Mr. Zhang Weijian can also have more discussion with you. And now I would like to give the floor to our next speaker, Ms. Patricia. And uh, she's going to talk about the innovative technologies or emerging technologies and rural prosperity. Great, thank you very much. Um, before I begin, I'd like to extend my thanks to the US Heartland China Association and the other organizers of this roundtable for inviting me and the others to participate. Today, I'll be discussing emerging technologies, their use in agriculture, and the potential implications for rural prosperity. Um, I'd like to start also just by saying that my presentation today is derived from a white paper that I co-authored with a team of RAND colleagues, and our work was supported by the Party Global Human Progress Initiative and the Tech and Narrative Lab at the Party RAND Graduate School. Um, I'm happy to send the link along, or I can post it in the chat and um, when I wrap up my talk. But the paper is available publicly. It's called Addressing Emerging Technology Adoption in Food Production Through Digital Games. And it examined blockchain, the internet of things, artificial intelligence with machine learning and satellite imaging um, and how they could be used or are being used in agriculture with a particular focus on their use in India and Pakistan. So using that paper as my foundation for today's talk, I'll be discussing how stakeholders look to emerging technologies as solutions for agricultural issues, particularly in the context of climate change, and how it's important to consider the potential uses and impacts of emerging technologies within a broader context that accounts for agriculture's embeddedness in economic, political, legal, social, and cultural contexts. Finally, I'll present a few of the implications of emerging tech adoption for rural prosperity in the United States. So to kick off, I'll be looking at, uh, chatting a little bit about emerging technology use in agriculture. Use of technology is obviously already widespread in agric agricultural practices around the world, but emerging technologies should be framed as a distinct category as they're new and innovative technologies that are likely to have significant or disruptive impacts and due to their novelty or innovativeness, they carry unknown risks. So in response to major crises like the global, global food crisis in 2007 and 2008, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic or climate change, government and other regional, international, regional and local stakeholders often look to technological solutions to develop mitigation plans. And it's important to know what types of technologies are being promoted as solutions to different problems as we've heard over all of the um, conversations so far today. With that in mind, I'd like to provide a quick overview of a few emerging technologies and their use in agriculture. Um, I'm gonna sort of briefly touch on blockchain. I won't get too much into the steps, um, but I'm happy to talk about it more. 
A blockchain is a decentralized and encrypted ledger for storing transactions across a peer-to-peer -peer network. And by using this type of technology, you can confirm transactions like transferring funds, sharing encrypted data, or tracing shipments, and ensure that those transactions and user identities are never compromised. Blockchain has been around mostly in the context of cryptocurrencies since early 2010, but its use in agriculture has become more recent. In the interest of time, I won't walk through each of these steps, but the takeaway from this um, depiction that I have up on the screen is that um, the system ensures both confidentiality and traceability for each trading partner involved in the supply chain, particularly when we're talking about this in the context of the food supply. So for use in the food system, blockchain's benefits include providing accurate information for traceability of products and increased transparency in transactions. These benefits could improve food safety. So for example, in the United States, there was one person who died and 106 people who were infected due to an outbreak of salmonella across 21 states. And this was in late 2016 through July of 2017. The uh, regulators were able to identify that it was consumption of ground beef that was the common factor with infection, but then investigators ran into problems in terms of tracing the source of that ground beef. When foodborne diseases threaten public health, the first step in a root cause analysis is accurate traceability. And a traditional communication framework for food traceability relies on information through various channels and participants with usually considerable human involvement along the value chain. And this can be problematic. People don't remember where they ate or where they got their food from or exactly what they had, especially if it's been weeks since they became sick and an investigator is only getting to them several days afterwards. Consequently, a system of traceability that's tamper-proof, secure, and accessible is needed. And that's where blockchain would come in to be able to quickly respond to issues like foodborne illness outbreaks. There are definitely some limitations to its use, however. It's a decentral, it has a decentralized nature, and the nodes potentially span across the globe, which create regulatory governance and legal challenges. There's the digital divide, which is the gap in opportunities to access information and communication technologies between different socioeconomic levels. So some areas, some populations, some individuals may have access to this resource and others won't. Plus, there are differences in computing infrastructure and capabilities meaning that some farmers, regions, and countries will be left behind with more widespread adoption of blockchain. And the blockchain should contain all members of the supply chain, which is difficult to maintain across highly complex systems. So if just one piece is missing, the transparency and traceability are lacking. For the Internet of Things, also known as IoT, um, it's defined as a system of interrelated internet-connected objects or devices that are able to collect and transfer data over a wireless network without direct human intervention. So the image I have up on the screen depicts how wireless sensors in an agricultural field can send information to a gateway node, which then communicates through the internet uh, to users, remote users, through mobile communications, through computer access, um, and through databases. IoT devices can help to improve crop yields by testing soil health, uh, moisture content, temperature, humidity, and other measures in real time. They can also be used to forecast and, uh, and monitor the weather, which can improve energy and water consumption. IoT devices in conjunction with other emerging technologies like cloud computing can provide ways to modernize agricultural production by allowing, as I mentioned, weather monitoring, water management, um, by monitoring the health of crops and livestock. In addition, IOTs can be used to improve food safety processes, the traceability of products, um, production efficiency, distribution optimization. But like blockchain, IOT also has its limitations, particularly related to regulation, as it's difficult to ensure quality control of devices and their performance. And they're also vulnerable to cyber attacks. And like any data dependent product, there are concerns about user privacy and the data that's collected about participants. Artificial intelligence refers to the general ability of computers to emulate human thought and perform, perform tasks in real world, real, excuse me, real world environments like visual perception or decision making. 
While machine learning refers to the technologies and algorithms that enable systems to identify patterns, make decisions, and improve themselves through experience and data. AI and machine learning can be used in a number of studies in agriculture as well, including to predict crop yields, detect diseases, optimize energy and water use. However, these technologies are usually context specific in their applications, which means that they must be designed and implemented in specific settings and cannot be applied broadly or brought up to scale. They also require large sets of consistent and reliable data for AI and machine learning development that can be difficult to collect, classify, and use. And differences across users in how they collect and classify their data um, limits the interoper interoperability of data sets, adding to the challenges of developing useful AI applications. Satellite imaging isn't necessarily an emerging technology in the way we might think of it, although when combined with some of these other technologies with being used in novel ways, it's the most advanced in terms of its use in agriculture, and it's currently in use in agricultural settings around the world. Satellite imaging is used to estimate crop yields. We heard it in, I believe it was the second presentation about carbon sequestration, um, monitor, monitoring diseases, uh, precision agriculture, and providing fast and accurate accounting for water resources. As an example, in the United States, where agriculture accounts for about 80 to 90% of consumptive water use, data from the NASA Landsat allows efficient water allocations at the field level. Um, but in terms of limitations, satellites are dependent on weather conditions and the timing of when the satellite will revisit a particular area. There are also limitations to the spatial resolution and accuracy of imaging and it can be prohibitively expensive for farmers to access and analyze satellite data. So that was really content from the paper that I mentioned at the start of my talk. Um, and in presenting these technologies, I'd like to focus on two of the key takeaways from that paper. Uh, one, that data governance and sharing mechanisms, uh, including ownership, privacy, and security, are common key challenges across technologies and that there is a need to understand the nature and evolution of technologies specific to their embeddedness in the food supply system. And that second point is where I'll be picking up for the, set, the last few minutes of the talk. Um, so when considering potential impacts in the adoption of emerging technologies in agricultural settings, stakeholders should assess potential impacts in economic, political, and legal, and social and cultural contexts. So for economic context, stakeholders should assess potential infrastructure capabilities and constraints, whether there are data interoperability standards, who will have control over the technology and its resulting data, and if it's likely to be under corporate or private control, how will that impact other stakeholders? And there should be consideration for small farm holders and whether, whether they'll have access and support to adopt the same technologies that larger farms have. For political and legal context, we should acknowledge that these technologies often are not good fits for existing regulatory regimes or frameworks. By their very nature, emerging technologies are novel or innovative. So while we might be able to learn from existing regulatory frameworks and policy tools, policymakers will need to respond to new challenges and risks presented by the development and adoption of these technologies. Looking at the legal implications of smart contracts, um, technology ownership, identity management, highlights some of those regulatory challenges. And we need to acknowledge that food systems tend to be decentralized and involve multiple stakeholders across the supply chain. And that can lead to differences in data collection and data sharing. In a social and cultural context, um, the adoption of these technologies heavily revo revo um, relies on er the adoption of earlier technologies like mobile communications, broadband internet, the existence and maintenance of technology and communication structure. So stakeholders need to consider the digital divide and di digital literacy within regions where these technologies may be promoted as solutions to different issues like climate change. There's the potential to exacerbate the digital divide and gaps in digital li literacy by only providing access and support for these technologies in some regions. So what does this mean in terms of rural prosperity? Um, this 
uh, figure is drawn from um, the Task Force on Agriculture and Rural Prosperity, who gave a report to the President of the United States in 2017. They identified that um, harnessing innovation and technology as a key action area for promoting agriculture and rural prosperity in the United States. The report framed this action in the context of food security, noting, and that this is a direct quote, to feed a hungry world, we will need to harness innovation to increase output across American farmlands. And also that increased crop yields, technological innovation can improve crop quality, nutritional value, and food safety. The report illustrates how stakeholders look to innovative techn technological solutions for agricultural issues and for climate change. But as you may have been able to glean from the presentation already, there are some really clear challenges for adopting emerging technologies in rural areas, including access to capital, infrastructure and trained workforces, as well as the existing, the current quality of life, making sure that there's a um, high level of education and health services to support rural farmers and ranchers. And the last piece is making sure that um, Potential adopters have trust and confidence in the government institutions and corporate organizations that will be their partners for technology adoption and for prosperity. With these challenges in mind, I'd like to end my talk with just a few questions for your long term consideration, not necessarily for the Q&A, but things to think about. Um, first, what is needed to assess the potential usefulness and effectiveness of these technologies in agriculture? How can we consider the economic, political, legal, social, and cultural context of potential adoption? And how can stakeholders be engaged in the process of assessing adoption of new technologies? Thank you all for your attention. And I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. 感谢。Thank you, Ms. Stapleton, for your wonderful remarks. And thank you for sharing with us the emerging technologies as well as their potential applications in agriculture and the potential significance for our rural prosperity. I think all these uh, new technologies, such, such as IoT, AI, are not new to us, but when they are connected with agriculture, which is a traditional sector, on, still gives me the feeling that future is here. Um, this is very forward-looking and prescient. It's like you said, in rural prosperity, these new technologies will have strong prospects for application. China emphasizes that science and technology is the primary driver of productivity. Both China and the United States are science and technology powerhouses. I'm sure we will have uh, great potentials and space for cooperation. Thank you again for your wonderful speech. So far, we have uh, finished all the uh, five presentations for this session. So I'd like to ask our commentator, Mr. Pan Jiahua, CAST member and professor and a former director general of Research Institute for Eco-Civilization of CAS, to take the floor. Welcome. Thank you, moderator. I'm honored to have this opportunity to talk to and learn from experts in related areas. I'm humbled as a commentator, and I've listened to Professor Liao Fan's pithy and insightful comments on each and every presentation. I think he's already done my job. I have nothing more to add, but I do feel that I have learned a lot from all these presentations. For example, I heard from Ms. Fitzgerald that the U.S. has done a lot through the decade of ag under the Paris Accords. I think this is very significant. We also have the one plus N framework in China to implement the carbon neutrality goals of Paris Agreement. 
and for agriculture, we are also formulating related programs. Professor Li Zhou analyzes the role of carbon sequestration in China's ecosystem governance, which is very accurate and to the point. The potential of carbon storage in ecosystem governance is very significant. And this is also a very innovative area. And Professor Ortiz Bobi and Professor Zhang Weijian discussed the uh, impact of climate change on agriculture and total factor productivity, especially from the perspective of climate resilience. And their researches are very inspiring. And Ms. Stapleton from Rand Corporation also presented a wonderful presentation, which is futuristic and highly relevant at the same time. The new technologies are highly disruptive and also involve some risks, which require improved grasp in terms of governance and awareness of technologies and science. I have also prepared a few slides. to share with you on my take on related issues. First, we need to look at the uh, definitions of agriculture and the countryside. The definitions are quite diversified. Rural region is a geographic concept. A special committee under the government also on, has its own definition of rural from the perspective of land use. And the changing land use landscape. Starting from the fourth assessment report, there are some new changes to the terms. And there is stronger focus on sectoral rural region, combining agriculture, forestry, and other land uses to cover both industrial and geographic senses. So when we talk about rural prosperity, like you mentioned, you have uh, emphasized the vulnerability, adaptability to climate change. For carbon neutrality, this is part of the goals of rural prosperity and also part of the contribution to carbon neutrality. Professor Zhang Weijian and Professor Li Zhou both emphasized biomass. The burning of biomass produces carbon dioxide, but the sources are from the photosynthesis of plants. So actually it's carbon neutral and climate neutral. It's not extra source of carbon. And biomass as source of energy has great advantage. First, it has huge potentials. And second, as a form of energy, it can be very flexible. It can be solid. It can be forms of gas like 
biogas, it can also be liquid, like ethanol. And we can also convert it into secondary energy, energy for power generation. And for biomass, actually, it's quite um, flexible. For instance, if you want to have the solar panel or if you want to have the wind uh, turbine, actually, you need to store all these energy or the electricity. But actually, for biomass, it's quite flexible. And for carbon sink that we have been talking about, it's quite potential. And uh, we have already listened to some speakers mentioning carbon sink because currently we have only limited resources on this planet. So we need to improve and increase carbon sink. And uh, compared with the fossil fuel emission, actually the carbon sink or the level of the carbon sink is still lagging behind. When we talk about rural prosperity and uh, net zero carbon development, we need to make sure that the vast rural areas in China can supply for themselves. So self-efficiency is a key word here. We need to develop solar panels, wind turbines, and biomass for rural China. Because different provinces have different characteristics. So we need to make sure that each and every province in China has its own way of self-efficiency in terms of energy and also for the electricity used by the agricultural machinery we also need to make sure that all these electricity is more and more low carbon and also is more uh, greener in the future and uh, we also need to think about the price for these electricity or the energy. And uh, a lot of people are now talking about the innovative ways of the energy facilities and uh, electricity generation from the renewable energies, such as uh, wind, solar, uh, et cetera, and hydropower. And actually, for these kind of renewable energies, they can contribute very much to rural prosperity in China. And in this way, the net zero carbon development is also something that we can achieve in the future. And also, we need to think about water, land, energy. When we talk about food safety, we need to think about the safety of water resources, land, and also energy. In China, actually, there are some provinces which have destroyed the forestry to develop solar panels. But I don't think this is a correct way. For the forestry, we need to protect the forest because forests are by nature the natural carbon sink. Even if we want to develop renewable energies, we can't destroy forests to develop renewable energies, such as solar. And water resources are also quite important for China, especially water quality is very important for China. A lot of experts have already mentioned this. 
and the significance of water quality in terms of contributing to the food safety in China and rural prosperity in China. Some of the provinces in China are dry land area. I believe also in the United States, some of your states are also having water scarcity. So how to make sure that with limited water resources, we can still improve agricultural pro productivity. This is something we need to talk about or we need to consider in a future development. And uh, we need to have this integration consideration for the integrated system for water, land, and energy. And uh, on this slide, I have put two photos here showing the solar panels. And some of the solar panels are installed in some water bodies. And in this way, I think the utilization of space can be improved. That is to say, the rural prosperity should be considered in line with the integrated system of all the energies, especially the renewable energies. And 20 years ago, no one in China was considering this, but currently with rural prosperity, a top priority in China, we need to think about how to combine rural prosperity with renewable energies so as to achieve the low carbon or even zero carbon development. For wind, solar, or biomass, all these provide low cost energy services. And in this way, we can create more job opportunities for Chinese people. And also in China, we have a key phrase called San Nong, which means agriculture, rural development, and farmers. So for these policies related to rural China, we always need to think about how to make sure agriculture is more and more climate smart and climate resilient. We need to help more farmers use renewable energies such as wind, solar, and biomass. And in this way, we can replace these conventional system and we can avoid pollutants and reduce climate related risks and living costs in rural China. And we always need to think about the cost. For solar panel, the cost to produce one degree of electricity is 0 0.1 renminbi. Actually, the cost is lower compared with the average cost of electricity currently in China. Because currently in China, one degree of electricity is on average 0 0.6 or 0 0.5 uh, renminbi. So that's why I say wind, solar, and biomass are low-cost energy contribution. And thank you. This is my observation. Thank you very much. And uh, you have given us a uh, very good comment for the previous panelists. And also you have given us some of your insights for rural prosperity and our topic. And uh, now we have already concluded 
uh, comment and also the uh, panelist speeches. We are a little bit behind schedule now, but we need to make sure that we have good um, time management and uh, we still have this Q&A session, but uh, for Q&A, we won't have 25 minutes. We only have 15 minutes. Anyone?提问是吗？哦哦哦，好的，呃，看呃，是我们是谁在控制这个这个就是提问的？目前线上没有提问。哦，好的。嗯。I got a question. I want to ask Professor Bobby, Ariel Bobby. And uh, currently, we're talking about climate change and also the reduction of carbon emission. In a whole context of human economic activities, when we talk about the concentration of CO2 as well as the human factor impact on agriculture productivity. You have mentioned that there are some negative and uh, positive impacts. Can we be sure that whether these impacts are positive or negative in the future? because I have listened to Chinese panelists and also the US panelists, but I have got uh, both positive and negative impacts. And I don't know, can we have a common consensus for this, especially for the future development? So Professor Ariel Bobby. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay, so the, thanks for the question. Um, that's a great question. Um, so there's a couple of things that didn't have the time to go over many of the details and the limitations of our study. Um, one thing to keep in mind in our study is that we do not remove the effect of CO2 fertilization, right? So that stays in that parallel world. So um, so that's something that empirically is difficult to do. Um, there's some studies trying to do that empirically uh, at, at a large scale observ with observational data, uh, but we do not remove that. And so that's something that you have to keep in mind, right? Uh, that is an important factor. Um, although I, I also want to bring um, to the attention that um, you know, that uh, this is for the entire agricultural, so that includes livestock, right? So, and, and I know there's a lot of emphasis on CO2 fertilization, but this is more general than just, uh, you know, C3 crops. And so there's, there's more um, that. So, but getting to the core of the question about, can we get some agreement? The, the, the study looked at the past. So look, you know, rear view mirror um, and, and the, the estimate is for a global estimate, right? Um, when you zoom in and you get into different parts of the world, the uncertainty is greater. So the model that we have does not have a lot of precision um, for different regions of the world. You have to go to places where the damages are larger, primarily in uh, you know, sub-Saharan Africa in the middle of, you know, sort of tropical areas. Uh, but it's more ambiguous in other places. And this is why I think it is important to, to do more regional analysis and more fine scale micro level analysis uh, to follow up this. Um, because you, know, you cannot, you know, uh, so when, when you have global, a global study, you, you, there's trade offs involved and uh, you need more uh, follow up uh, uh, studies to understand what's going on at a, at a 
at a finer spatial scale. So, um, so I hope I answered the question. So I, I, I just to a, a last point is that, um, um, you know, no single study is uh, correct. <laughs> and I think it's important to see a body of evidence of different studies and seeing how that uh, accumulation of evidence is looking. And when you look at global studies on say on crop yields, for instance, um, in the IPCC report, they 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 cite a few paper, a few pa global studies, uh, and they tend to look at negative. So the historical impact has been negative on crop yields, although those don't account for the CO two effect. That's one of the caveats. Thanks for the question. Uh, <coughs> Well, I very much agree with uh, Professor Ortiz Bobi. Any forecast or assessment is based on different scenario cases or different emissions. There are different ranges of emissions and temperature increases, say 1.5 degrees Celsius, 2 degrees Celsius. The uh, outcomes will be very different. I think from different regions of the uh, planet, the answers will be different as to whether the impact is negative or positive on balance as it concerns the uh, temperature changes and precipitation changes for areas with uh, lower accumulative temperature or base temperature the impact will be positive on balance. If our agricultural production, production or facilities cannot adapt to the disaster, and the impact can be devastating. So globally, in the long term, whether the impact will be positive or negative on balance from climate change, it depends on different scenarios. And second, it should be based on the general background of the region. Many researchers and forecasts and analyses have produced negative results on balance. A few regions and countries point to positive growth trend, and this shouldn't be a surprise as we have to take into account on different factors. But if humanity stays inactive and allows climate change to continue on the current trend, then the impact on economic and human activities will definitely be negative on balance. Historically, the impact on agricultural production depends on background and scenario. Well, well, there's still one US speaker who hasn't spoken yet, but his time is running out. So can we ask a US speaker to take the floor first? OK. Now, let me uh, give the floor to Mr. Greg Hansen, Vice President of the World Resource Institute, to make his closing comments, please. Great, thank you. Thank you, everyone. My name is Craig Hansen. I'm a Vice President at the World Resources Institute, a global research organization working at the nexus of environment and development. It is quite an honor here to be with you today uh, to have a chance to speak. Uh, thank, I want to thank the organizers, especially the U.S. Heartland China Association and CAS for the invitation here. I'm, I'm honored to be with such esteemed experts from China, as well as esteemed leaders from truly the heartland of America here. I see actually on the screen, I see former Governor Holden, as well as CEO Aaron Fitzgerald from the great state of Missouri. Um, I also see Ambassador Quinn 
uh, from the great state of Iowa. I happen to be from the even better state of Nebraska. So uh, uh, you really have the heartland here for you all. So I, I really am honored here. Um, this is, you all are talking about what we at WRI think of as one of the two biggest questions that humanity is gonna face over the next, into the mid-century. Those two questions are, you know, how is humanity going to provide energy for itself? And how is humanity going to feed itself in a manner that doesn't destroy the world in the process, right? It's essentially, I call it the quest for food and fuel. Everything else is footnotes, right? So this is really, I'm really excited about the conversations today. I'm really excited about what people are talking about and the, in the various presentations. We really, I, I, I agree with basically everything people have said. Hope someone's taking great notes here because this is really a good articulation here. And what I've heard actually falls into kind of a four part strategy for dealing with this issue. Uh, first of all, we need to produce. The world needs America, China, the rest of the world. We need to produce more food for a growing population, but on the same land, right? We can't just keep on expanding and cutting down tropical rainforests, converting grasslands. We need to, to meet climate at the same time as meeting our food security goals. We have to produce more right on, on the same land. That really means increasing yields sustainably. We heard a lot of speakers talk about that today. And I think a lot of the conversation right now kind of forgets that point. They talk about the environmental stuff, but they forget the point that folks, we got to keep yields going. And it's going to be even harder than it was in the past because you have climate change, as we heard two, two speakers today, pushing down on yields in many places around the planet, right? So we have a grand challenge here. So produce, fundamental. Number two, we have to protect. At the same time they're producing more food for humanity, we have to protect the nature that remains. The forests, the grasslands, the wetlands, you're doing in your nation of China, we're doing in the United States, more needs to be done in our countries as well as around the world. We can't feed ourselves yet deforest the Amazon at the same time, right? Climate biodiversity, it just, it won't stay unless we actually figure out how to produce and protect. Third, we have to reduce. We have to reduce the inefficiencies in the system. It's a travesty that one third of all food that's grown, right? gets lost between the farm and the fork in a world where one in 10 people go hungry. That is a travesty. And who would have thought in the 21st century, right? We're growing so much food that doesn't make it into the human mouth. At the same time, we need to grow as one of the speakers just talked about, how do you boost yields while also reducing the pollution, right? And so again, a grand challenge, I think we can do it. Finally, we have to restore. We heard another speaker talk about this too. We have to restore some of nature that's been lost to bring back forests where they once were on marginal lands, bring back wetlands. We also have to restore our degraded agricultural lands. If we're gonna produce more for more people, that means we have to rebuild the soils and rebuild the productivity of a lot of degraded land in our own countries as well as around the world. So produce, protect, reduce, restore. To me, that's the grand strategy. They all have to be at the same time. And our two great nations have a very important role for making that a reality. At the same time, we've heard something what I call the three eyes, the importance of innovation. You can't get there without new innovation. And several speakers talked about that. You can't get there without investment. And several speakers talked about the amount of investment and actually how in some countries, my home country, the amount of investment per GDP is going down. We, we have to get more investment up. And finally, it didn't come up, but I think we all believe this. It all involves inclusion. There's a role for everyone, big farms to small farms. China and the US all the way to Africa, from farmers all the way to consumers. The beautiful thing about the food system for, the, for, the, for this century is there's a role for everyone and everyone has to do something here. So I'm really excited about basically what we've been talking about today. I do think achieving food security while also achieving climate security is one of the biggest challenges of the next 30 years. I think technically we can do it. Morally, we must do it. And politically, we will do it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hansen, for your wonderful closing comments. And due to the constraint of time, and you don't have enough time to make your views, I'm sure we will have more time in the future. In the interest of time, and let me uh, 
give time for the last question. Last question. I think Mr. Pan wanted to ask a question. Yes, I raised my hand. I want to ask, Ms. Erin Fitzgerald, I think the decade of AL, AG is very creative initiative. Do you have clear carbon neutrality action goals for this initiative? For example, in terms of agricultural production and in the space of farms, will measures be implemented to adopt renewable energy? I think this is also very important for the US. So do you have uh, specific targets and measures on the decade of VAC? Thank you. Thank you very much. So the decade of VAC has really been a about a movement at present. Um, many of the organizations and CEOs that have, have science-based targets, um, but often they're not working in collaboration with farmers. So the decade of VAC is about making sure that we align and start working together as both the food and agri sector. And I will add energy in there as well, because the bioeconomy is quite interrelated in terms of uh, the, the energy sector, in particular, when we see biofuels and bioenergy. It is our ambition, though, to set a sector goal. So part of that has been getting everybody just to work together and establish a common vision that took two years to get to that and COVID. We, we really asked, now's the time to meet the moment. We are also estimating, uh, Dr. Wang's on the line with the National Academy of Science, which we should, we should collaborate with you, on what is the potential for drawdown of our agricultural working lands. It, we must then ask, how can we sh get to a shared commitment that every, from a farmer, to a financial institution, to a, a brand can collectively own and put their strengths to work. So we are doing the hard work of what I would call collaboration, which has not reached to a goal, but that is what we are doing. Uh, we are, we're having those hard discussions. Can we agree on a voluntary uh, growth and um, getting the get everyone, everyone to sign into a vision was step one, of course, when you talk about culture change and change management. We have to all agree on a common North Star, the vision. And then what can we do together towards that vision? I will say there's also um, some key um, action tracks. Um, the transformative investment is a key component. I think we talked about that just slightly, but the, our ambitions for the sector are too low. We are not innovating and investing fast enough in this sector to get to the transformation required. And um, we recently did a study to look at how much current investment is happening in the United States. And as part of those targets, we believe economic growth and rural vibrancy need to be included in those targets. So my question I'm asking every leader is how much money do we need to raise to invest in both our research the adaptation and the innovation on our farms, and of course, the insurance and financial mechanisms that will support that transition, um, because we are not mobilizing the full weight of the financial sector to support our farmers and ranchers. So that's part of the, the conversations. I wish I had a bigger answer and a big goal, but we're working through those conversations now. Thank you, Aaron, for your response. Due to time constraint, we uh, have to wrap up the Q&A session. On behalf of the Chinese side, let me wrap up the dialogue. I very much agree with uh, what Mr. 
Hansen said, the question boils down to agriculture, rural development. We need to continue to produce, protect. So the focal issue is how we can achieve green development. Um, Professor Zhang also mentioned that uh, currently the whole world is talking about green agriculture and also climate resilient agriculture. So we want to have economic development in the same time, we also want to have green development. We want to reduce GHG emissions. And uh, as the Chinese saying goes, uh, food is the prime want of people. So we really need to pay attention to this because adaptation and mitigation to climate change is a common challenge for all the populations on this planet. So we need to transform the agriculture and rural policies, especially in China, we need to transform some of people's uh, mindset and also their farming practices for many years. And uh, so we have the same goal. We need to adapt to climate change. We need to adapt to a green development path for agriculture. And uh, through today's discussion, we need to use more and more innovative technologies. We need to utilize emerging technologies. Apart from the technologies, we also need to innovate the policy frameworks. And also we need to conduct more societal researches. And uh, just as Mr. Hansen mentioned, uh, technolo technologically, we can do it. And uh, morally, we should do it. And uh, also, we need to collaborate with each other, especially we need to collaborate between China and the United States. Our two countries are two big agriculture countries. So in terms of the emerging technologies, we need to change, exchange information. We also need to collaborate with other countries, our two need to collaborate with other countries so that we can contribute to the common agriculture development and rural prosperity in a whole world. So this topic is actually a multidisciplinary or cross-disciplinary topic for all of us. And CAS is willing to continue our dialogues with United States, Heartland, China Association, Association, and also other institutions such as World Resources Institute and uh, other partners. So today we also meet some new friends such as Rand and uh, professor from Cornell University. So I think today we have had a quite constructive and fruitful discussion. And I believe this is a very good starting point for all of us. On this good platform, we want to continue our collaboration. We can even expand our cooperation projects. And uh, Ms. Fisterard just mentioned that uh, she also wants to collaborate with CAS, with um, Rural Development Institute in the future. So I really look forward to meeting all of you on site after we emerge from COVID pandemic. And I also look forward to you visiting China, especially the field visit in rural China. This is very important for us. And that's it for my closing remark. And thank you again for your participation.